Hello and welcome to another Boston BioLife webinar. Today we're pleased to have Apex Biologics presenting with us today. Uh, the topic is why PRP is still the most reliable, cost-effective, and scientifically proven regenerative treatment. And presenting for Apex Biologics today is Matthew Murphy, PhD, and Dr. George Chen. Um, both are established scientists and technical uh, experts in not just PRP, but regenerative medicine in general, uh, often lecturing. Matt was one of our first presenters in Boston BioLife uh, almost five years now. So he's been out there in the trenches helping develop new technology, doing studies and publishing, as well as contributing in a lot of internet form. So we're very pleased to have both Matt and George with us today discussing PRP and uh, looking forward to your presentation, guys. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, Joe, it's uh, certainly a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank yourself, uh, Boston Biolife, as well as Apex Biologics for having me here. It's always a pleasure to be a part of a panel with such esteemed people, such as uh, Matt Murphy, which uh, everyone says is like the smartest guy in the room every time you're in the room with him. Uh, a little bit about myself, I'm a physiatrist. I practice uh, comprehensive pain management. I have a few different roles that I play, but primarily, um, my biggest, largest, most interesting passion is with regenerative medicine, and I do practice some uh, aesthetics as well, um, primarily down here in uh, Southern California, Newport Beach area. And Matt Murphy, I think he can speak about himself, but he's obviously, like I said, typically the smartest guy in the room, and I'd definitely say he's the smartest guy in this chat. I appreciate that, although uh, I don't think my wife would ever agree with that if I'm in the same room with her. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a scientist, a PhD doctor, not a medical doctor. I'm not going to be uh, reporting on uh, clinical advice per se, but strictly sticking to the basic science uh, and biology of regenerative medicine and referencing some published clinical work. Uh, I'm, I'm a biomedical engineer by trade. I design uh, devices and processes for isolating and purifying and concentrating a lot of these different regenerative elements that, that we can provide to patients. Thanks, George. All right, so let's get started. Uh, the learning objectives for this webinar are understanding the research-based treatments uh, for regenerative medicine, why I think, and maybe Matt thinks, why PRP is effective, some of the pros and cons of uh, platelet-rich plasma therapies, uh, what is the evidence for the treatments, and something that people may or may not be talking about enough, which is really how to evaluate and pick a, um, a solid PRP system. People have these many misconceptions regarding uh, how to obtain a good platelet-rich plasma, and I think at the end of this uh, webinar, we might be able to dispel some of those myths. So jumping right into it, let's talk about the studies and the research. Now, this is interesting. Almost every single uh, conference I go to, someone throws up a slide like this, and I constantly have to update this one slide in every single one of my talks. The last time I looked at this in PubMed, which is, mind you, just one of the major uh, lit review sources that we have, uh, it said something about 10,000. And in the three or four months since I last looked at it, it's exploded another you know, 15% to over 11,000 total references just in PubMed. And this is Mind you, just platelet-rich plasma, if you look up stem cells and bone marrow and adipose and all these other aspects, uh, it's almost astronomical. The interesting thing about this that people don't quite understand is that there's this misconception that this is uh, snake oil or uh, voodoo medicine. The truth of the matter is that there's uh, research and treatment protocols and treatment centers that are well established throughout the United States, truthfully throughout the world, and including our ivory towers such as Man's Greatest Hospital, MGH, and the Mayo Clinic and the Stanford's and the Cleveland Clinics of the world, you can go to these places and get uh, platelet-rich plasma and uh, stem cell type treatments. Let's talk about the PRP studies. Now, the truth is that their platelet-rich plasma has been very well studied, and it's been being studied for uh, many decades now. There's positive level one studies and level two studies um, concerning platelet-rich plasma and the treatment of musculoskeletal disorders, certainly orthopedic conditions, as well as uh, emerging data uh, looking at the um, neuroaxial system. 
And you'll see this, that we have uh, level one, level two evidence for positive level one, level two evidence, looking at treatment of uh, disc, lumbar disc, or, or uh, as well as osteoarthritis of the knee and hip, and uh, things that uh, relate to tendinopathy, tendinopathy, including greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Coming to the common extensor tendon, this uh, commonly known as uh, tennis elbow is what we widely consider as the poster child for regenerative medicine therapies. There have been well over 15, maybe 20 prospective randomized controlled trials looking at the effect of PRP on common extensor tendinopathy uh, performed throughout the world. Most of them with uh, echoing each other's results, demonstrating that there's a strong positive effect both on function as well as pain. There are studies looking at patellar tendinopathy, plantar fasciitis, as well as rotator cuff tendinopathy. Most of those are related to uh, survivability of uh, rotator cuff tears uh, after uh, rotator cuff uh, repair. Now, coming to uh, probably one of the seminal studies in regards to this is the Pierboom study, which what we have presented here is the one-year follow-up data these authors have actually taken these same patients and followed them up up to two years. And I think this is a fantastic study because it uh, shows a lot of the, the trends, if you will, that you'll see with these type of therapies. Keep in mind that regenerative medicine therapies, um, the, the, the goal in the thought process is not just to reduce pain and function and improve function, but also the idea that you are going to ideally be causing um, Build up or restructuring um, in of, of the of the tissue and promoting um, positive architecture. And you'll see this in their outcomes course. Now this is the disability arm shoulder hand scale, and I I like that this in this study this is the primary outcome. And the dash score is a disability index. The higher the number, the worse off the patient, and the higher their disability. You notice over here on this left hand. Um, side is the dash score. It's got numbers that go uh, up numerically, and on the x-axis we have zero to 52 weeks. Now the dark green line is the corticosteroid arm of the study. You notice that they start off at a relatively lower dash score, um, but that's all relative to the end point. The PRP arm is the light green arm of the study. Now you notice that there is a uh, possibly a greater trajectory decrease. Um, uh, at the beginning of this study for the corticosteroid arm, meaning that the patients improved much more faster, um, but that there's a leveling off at about the maybe seven, eight week mark, and that these the effects of the corticosteroids actually start to wear off. The two arms of the study actually cross over at the 12 week mark, and you'll see that by the time you get to 52 weeks, the corticosteroid arm of the study actually meanders back towards the baseline with a mean delta represented by this uh, double-headed pink arrow on the right-hand side of the graph. Now that mean delta for the corticosteroid arm is quite small, whereas for the PRP arm, you'll notice that it's uh, rather significant, probably about a three to four-fold um, change in uh, the beginning to the end. If you pull up the two-year data for this study, you'll see that the two arms of the study essentially flatline out and they plateau, and that um, the PRP arm actually persists to have improvements um, up to two years that are sustained. And this is the VAS scores for the study, and it sort of mimics the, uh, it actually reflects completely what their DASH scores show as well. There's a crossover at about 10 weeks of the two arms of the study, and we have persistent improvement in pain um, and function as the result of the study. What about knee osteoarthritis? Knee OA being the most common or one of the most commonly studied joints for arthritis um, is one of the primary uh, targets for a lot of regenerative medicine therapies. There have been multiple people who have actually looked at the treatment of um, Knee OA comparing platelet-rich plasma to what is in a lot of world, in lots of parts of the world, what is considered the standard of care prior to total knee arthroplasty, which is hyaluronic acid acid visco supplementation injection. Now, there again have been multiple studies looking at this. Um, 
And I would say that for the most part, these studies demonstrate that the platelet-rich plasma is superior to the hyaluronic acid. These patients in this study, there were 150 patients with actually early and severe OA, um, and they were randomized to HA versus hyaluronic acid, follow up to six months um, with a significant difference between the two arms, showing that the PRP was uh, more developed, excuse me, uh, resulted in more and more efficacious benefits uh, with longer efficacy compared to hyaluronic acid. Specifically, there were 60 patients, excuse me, six month follow up uh, with 50 patients with severe OA. Um, and the PRP was equally efficacious to low molecular weight hyaluronic acid. A comment here to say that we generally know that high molecular weight uh, hyaluronic acid actually has better. Um, better efficacy than the low molecular weight. Um, but in this study, however, in the younger patients with mild OA, the PRP did show um, better and longer lasting results. And that's important because we in general have always or have always understand as clinicians that patients in general with less severe disease are going to do better anyway. This is a study that I particularly like, and I use this as a great teaching point. Uh, this is a fantastic study that looked at patients who are planning to undergo total knee arthroplasty. So these are patients who have pathologic cartilage, pathologic knees, um, and at the time of total knee arthroplasty, their synovium and the cartilage was harvested and co-cultured with both platelet-rich plasma and or hyaluronic acid. The outcomes that they were looking at were um, pro-inflammatory or catabolic markers such as TNF-alpha, IL-6, and IL-1-beta, as well as matrix metalloproteinases, which are known to break down collagen. Now, the anabolic markers that they were looking at were hyaluron synthase, as well as um, agrican and different types of collagen. Now, going back to this, excuse me, uh, the interesting thing was that both arms of the study, both the PRP and the hyaluronic acid, did show increase in catabolic markers, excuse me, decrease in catabolic markers, and including the IL-6, IL-1-beta, matrix metalloproteinase, et cetera, as well as increase in anabolic markers, um, although the PRP was shown to be uh, more pro-hyaluron synthase compared to the hyaluronic acid. If you look at other studies that have done similar styles of looking at it, you'll see that there are synergistic effects between platelet-rich plasma and hyaluronic acid. And so this is one thing that I like to throw out there for people who are naysayers regarding hyaluronic acid or even naysayers regarding regenerative medicine, is that if you do perform any hyaluronic acid injections, you are essentially already performing regenerative medicine. This is a systematic review uh, that uh, a few friends of mine and I wrote uh, back in 2017, and we were interested in just synthesizing the data out there that looked at PRP versus hyaluronic acid. And at the time of us looking at this, um, we found that there were about 11 or 12 studies that had compared to this that are well done, that they weren't case reports and, and case series, et cetera. And they compared um, PRP to, eight, uh, excuse me, to HA for NEOA, and including pain and functional outcome scores, essentially all these studies showed that there was superiority for PRP over um, HA. Now, since we've written this, there have been more sophisticated systematic reviews and meta-analyses that have been performed, looking at all these studies and essentially coming up with the same conclusions. Here's a study that looks at the clinical and MRI outcomes after PRP treatment. And I think this is a, well, it's a very interesting study. It's published in a clinical journal of sports medicine. And they had a small number of people that with kale uh, grades zero to two with knee pain. And each of these patients received a single injection of six milliliters of PRP from the cascade system. These patients were followed up to 12 months and had a MRI at the one year mark. And that's interesting that the pain scores were significantly decreased um, and functional and clinical scores also improved in these patients, especially at the six month and one year mark, which again, um, portrays that idea that it takes time for these regenerative medicine therapies to develop uh, their full effect. Interestingly enough, um, MRIs demonstrated no change in the compartments in at least 73% of the cases at the one year mark. 
um, but they did think that some of the patients did have what they believed to be um, improvement in the MR images of their knee OA. The question here then is though, is that um, should we be possibly looking at this as a preemptive uh, treatment for people who have early onset knee arthritis or people who are developing meniscal issues um, instead of waiting for people to develop more severe uh, disease before we intervene, is there something we can do regeneratively to intervene um, to delay uh, the onset of their disease? Here's a study uh, performed by uh, Greg Lutz's group out of HSS. Uh, this, this study took many, many years to get out. Uh, I think it's an interesting study, but uh, well done. I'm personally friends with a few of the authors on this paper, um, but they looked at lumbar intradiscal PRP, uh, as a prospective double-blind randomized control study. Now, in this study, they were looking at patients that had a single, what they believed to be single-level, uh, single-disc uh, disease uh, based off of uh, MRI imaging, looking for high-intensity zone um, uh, findings, as well as based off of physical exam. Now, all these patients did undergo uh, discography to identify whether or not their disc was painful. These patients were included because they had low back pain greater than six months. They had failed conservative therapy. Um, their disc heights were maintained, meaning they didn't turn black and were not small and squished down, and that the size of their protrusion was less than five millimeters. The methods for the study, uh, the, these patients underwent uh, provocative discography to identify presence of concordant pain, as well as to identify the annular disruption. These patients were randomized two to one to either receive one to two millimeters of platelet-rich plasma, which was the treatment group, or one to two millimeters of additional contrast agent as the control group. These patients were followed up up to one year by an independent observer. Um, but the ones that were provided uh, in the control group were also given the opportunity to cross over into the active um, treatment group at the eight week mark. Here are their results. Now, this is interesting because this is data that is, uh, this uh, for this graph, it only shows the results up to eight weeks. And you'll notice a few things. Um, the dark blue line, it's probably a little hard to read there, but that's the control arm. And you'll notice that their uh, pain level, their current pain level remained relatively uh, static uh, at about 4.5 to five on a numeric pain scale. You'll notice that the error bars are seem quite large, but they really only range from 3.5 to 6. So it's not, um, it's not, you know, magnitudes of scale uh, across. Now the orange line is the PRP treatment arm. You notice that um, over time and quite relatively rapidly, uh, this arm on average went from a pain scale about 4.5 down to about 3.5. Now that's one number, um, but this is the trend that you see that goes. Um, pretty consistently um, during this eight-week follow-up period. This is the numeric pain score that shows the current pain, the best pain, and uh, the worst pain. And the whole point here is that all three uh, arms are relatively parallel uh, to each other and uh, have a downward slope over from baseline to a year. This is the SF36, which is a uh, functional outcome scale. It's got eight sections in it that looks at uh, social function, uh, ment mentality, excuse me, mental function, uh, general health of, and well-being of the people. And the higher the score is uh, going to be the better um, uh, functional outcome scale for these patients. Again, at, from baseline to one year, um, you see this general trend. Uh, of the uh, study getting better. They have broken it down to the physical as well as the pain um, components of this uh, functional outcome scale, but in general, you'll see that uh, there's an upward trend. So conclusion from this study, again, it has a low end, but uh, 14 of the 25 patients who received intradiscal PRP demonstrated improvements in pain and function and satisfaction compared to uh, two of the 15 people in the, uh, in the, in the control group. There's no complications or adverse effects. And uh, their conclusions were that intradiscal PRP is a uh, potential cell therapy for uh, specific subsets of patients with discogenic low back pain. 
Here is a, another uh, table that shows a number of studies that have looked at PRP treatments for knee osteoarthritis. And um, it's a busy slide, but we can say that not all studies have actually shown that um, PRP is beneficial for knee osteoarthritis. And it takes, um, you know, and, and it's good to dive into all the studies, to be frank with you, but we're going to dive into at least one of them uh, here below. And here's a study by Brian Cole out of uh, Rush University. And it's fascinating because when I read the study, actually, my interpretation is actually that they did have positive outcomes, um, but not necessarily in the time frame that they're looking at. Um, but let's dive into this. Now, this is the study by, um, by Dr. Cole and his group and published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2017. And they looked at HA versus PRP prospective double-blind randomized control trial comparing clinical outcomes. They had 111 patients and they followed people up to uh, 52 weeks. And they looked at the WOMAC, um, the, the WOMAC score as well as pain scores. Um, but their conclusion was that WOMAC was same for the two groups. Um, the thing about this study is that you have to understand that uh, they utilized a 10 milliliter blood draw to obtain four milliliters of platelet-rich plasma. And the concern with this study is whether or not this 10 millimeter blood draw is enough to constitute, um, or to concentrate enough platelets uh, as an ad hoc measure for growth factors, cytokines to produce a significant PRP, especially for a joint uh, as voluminous and capacious as the um, as the knee, and I don't know if capacious is a real word, but uh, certainly it's something that if anybody's ever pulled out a uh, fluid from a septic knee, they would understand that you can easily pull out 50, 60 milliliters of fluid out from that knee, even without it looking like it has a lot of fluid in it. All right, I'm done with my section. I'd like to pass the baton to Dr. Matt Murphy so he can talk about the science of PRP. Thank you, George. Uh, in this section, we're going to talk a little bit about the science behind PRP, um, where it's good, the pros and cons, et cetera. So it's important to look at both the concentration and the compensation composition of your PRP. Too often, people uh, fixate on either the percent recovery of platelets, which is important, or the concentration or enrichment factor, which might be important that is entirely depending on the volume of platelets. So um, in terms of trying to determine the most optimal dosing of platelets, really we're reliant on in vitro data. Uh, and that's not the same thing as clinical data. Um, PRP is a little bit behind uh, bone marrow aspirate and bone marrow concentrate in this regard. At least in vitro, looking at the response of other cells, whether it's um, uh, growth of, of fibroblastic cells or angiogenesis, that's the growth of uh, microvessels from endothelial cells. Somewhere in the range of um, one to three million seems to be optimal. So we're talking about anywhere between 5x enrichment above a baseline peripheral blood platelet count uh, to more than 20x. Uh, there, is a, there is a threshold, though, when you go above three million per uh, microliter. Um, you start to have an inhibition effect where the cells slow down in their metabolism and they do they have some other negative effects. So there is such a thing as over-concentrating your PRP. Um, if the bottom, the no effect, if the platelet count is below 500 in your PRP, most people are starting somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000 uh, per microliter. You haven't done much enrichment and you're not gonna see much additional benefit versus just using peripheral whole blood, or maybe even the platelet poor plasma fraction. Most of the audience will be very familiar with the, the inflammatory healing cascade. Uh, this graph just demonstrates the, the cascade and the symphony of the different cell types that come into uh, an injury in, in a vascular tissue, um, release their factors, and leave um, and or uh, deposit extracellular matrix and or remodel that tissue until we get back to homeostasis. Um, what's, what's critical here is the ability of cells to come in and respond. 
And the reason why this slide is, is part of the presentation is because that's really what we're trying to do with ERP. We're trying to simulate uh, what happens at the event of an injury to spark some local inflammation, a release of cytokines, to try to get other cells in the nearby area to home to the source of that injury. So um, how you make your PRP is important and how you deliver your PRP is probably equally important because you wanna make sure that the epicenter of your treatment is where you want those cells to migrate in and respond. So the goal, as we just said, is to try to recreate acute inflammation at the site of injury so that uh, the other cells will come in. And that could even include mesenchymal stem cells that uh, naturally live in those tissues as pericytes on the outside of blood vessels. Um, most of the basis of PRP was using, um, here it says traditional PRP, but that means leukocyte rich. So this is red colored PRP. It's a little bit more pro-inflammatory. Uh, definitely you get some flare-ups and a little bit more short-term pain uh, at the injection site for the patient, but you're causing more of this local spike in of inflammation and recruitment of cells into that area. So by and large, the, the majority of data supports uh, some more of this micro-inflammation and localized inflammation with a leukocyte-rich PRP. And then, as we referenced earlier, the target concentration is to get somewhere above, uh, excuse the typo, it's supposed to be 10 to the 6 power, a million platelets per microliter. It's important to think biologically uh, as, of platelets as being nothing but little sacs that's full of cytokines and clotting factors. This isn't an intelligent cell with a nucleus or a brain. It's not getting signals from the environment and then secreting out variable different factors in response to those signals. It has a one-time dump of growth factors. So uh, what the injury is gonna get is whatever the platelet had when it was made. Erythrocytes or red blood cells make up 40 to 50% of the blood volume. Uh, it's more variable in bone marrow aspirate. Uh, that's just a, an interesting aside for anyone who practices with bone marrow. It's a carrier of oxygen. We don't know of any pro-regenerative properties that it has. Uh, we also don't know of any negative in, uh, effects or impedance to regenerative medicine. Uh, it's my opinion that the RBCs catch a bad rap for some of the negative side effects of leukocyte-rich PRP. It's just as an artifact, when it's leukocyte rich, you tend to get more red blood cells. Your PRP looks red in color. Uh, we have another slide with an in vitro, so we can talk more about that in a little bit. Some of us like to group uh, biologics into categories of indirect versus direct therapy. A, a direct therapy uh, would be more of a stem cell where it is sensing input signals, whether it's biochemical or biomechanical, and secreting cytokines and other factors in response to that, and adapting and changing what they secrete over time as the injury progresses into a remodeling phase. PRP is not that case. It's, it's indirect. Uh, it doesn't matter what the extent of the injury is. It's giving you that same dose of growth factors. Uh, the caveat is that PRP that includes white blood cells does have the ability to send out some signals, whether it was pro-inflammatory, something like uh, macrophages and granulocytes, uh, or there is some new evidence that some of the helper T cells can secrete anti-inflammatory proteins in the right environment. When we centrifuge whole blood to prepare PRP, uh, this is just an example uh, of, of a traditional centrifugation versus some kind of soft spin mechanism. Uh, Normally, if you spin it very hard for some period of time, your your platelets are going to converge with the white blood cells. And you end up in the middle as this uh, figure on the top right. We call it the buffy coat. It's white blood cells and platelets mixed together. So normally, you're going to be collecting those things together. The result is leukocyte-rich PRP because your platelets have white blood cells. Uh, there are a couple of different strategies for centrifuging your blood less time or less G-force. Uh, that causes the platelets to not collapse down with the white blood cells. And then it's possible to collect that plasma cloud, quote unquote, that contains uh, a lot of platelets as well as proteins, and then do a second processing step, whether it's a second centrifuge or uh, some kind of filtration to concentrate those platelets, but do so without collecting significant leukocytes in your PRP preparation.
This is a graphical demonstration of leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor. Uh, leukocyte rich, because we're collecting the whole buffing coat, it tends to have higher platelet count, but it also has more of the white blood cells, which can be inflammatory. There are some red blood cells inevitably, so it's going to have a red color. Uh, leukocyte poor, we're trying to take care to minimize the amount of white blood cells that go into that prep. As a result, the platelet count usually suffers a little bit. Without the red blood cells, uh, it looks more of a yellow or amber color. When, when would we want to use leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor? As we, as we described, leukocyte rich is a little bit more inflammatory because of those, those certain white blood cells. Um, we want to make sure if we're, if we're ticking off the injury and we're causing a spike in local inflammation and irritation, that we have cells in the nearby area that can respond to that. So if it's a vascular tissue, we know that there is a blood supply, there's an oxygen source, there are mesenchymal stem cells living on the little micro vessels. Uh, as pericytes, there's endothelial cells, uh, there's more fibroblasts. So all of these things can move and mobilize and come in and multiply in that injury site. That's probably why the earliest PRP studies that focused on soft tissue, like muscle and tendon injuries, were very successful. When the leukocyte-rich PRP was applied to avascular tissues, so like, for example, intraarticular injections for knee osteoarthritis, inside that joint capsule, there's no blood supply, there's not a lot of progenitor type cells. So in a sense, we're throwing gasoline on, on a bonfire at this point, causing inflammation with no real biologic mechanism to respond and to, to quench that inflammation that we cause. So uh, thus was created leukocyte poor PRP to be a bit less inflammatory, benefit from the growth factors of the platelet, benefit for some of the other cytokines that are in the plasma, but don't have that inflammatory edge. So it's probably a better application for avascular tissue like joints and discs. And it's certainly, whether you're doing leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor, uh, it's an appropriate lower cost alternative to uh, bone marrow concentrate therapy, which can be a little bit more costly and invasive and sometimes is, is not necessary. We don't need that extra power of stem cells to get the response that we want. One of those proteins in the platelet-poor plasma that we're very interested in is alpha-2 macroglobulin, also called A2M. It is a, a natural protease inhibitor. It's in the platelet-poor plasma. It's not in the platelets. So the more volume we take with our PRP, the more of that A2M we're going to get. Uh, additionally, I think we're going to talk in a minute about uh, some strategies for concentrating the platelet-poor plasma so we can beef up those, those A2M and other protein counts even higher. Uh, it slows down the natural degradation of, of cartilage, whether we're talking about degenerative joint, joint disease or degenerative disc disease. It binds up those catabolic enzymes that are associated with arthritis and DDD that slowly break down the extracellular matrix that we're never going to get back. So we slow the progression of the joint disease. Simultaneously, the A2M binds up a lot of the pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha and IL-1-alpha and beta. So Less inflammation is less pain. Maybe it's changing the environment and giving those resident cells in the joint a little bit a better opportunity to, to, to repair what they couldn't uh, without the treatment. Uh, the graph on the bottom right was just a, was some data that was collected by me a few years ago, looking at relative amounts of A2M uh, in the bone marrow aspirate before and after concentration uh, compared to peripheral blood. And what we see is statistically, there is no difference between uh, blood and BMA for A2M. Uh, A2M is actually secreted by the liver, so it makes sense that BMA and blood would have roughly equivalent amounts of A2M. This table summarizes some of the composition comparing PRP to bone marrow aspirate. Uh, we got to think of bone marrow aspirate as basically being blood that we're pulling out and filtering through the marrow stromal tissue. So it's blood, plus it's picking up these other progenitor cells along the way and dragging it out into the syringe with the blood. So um, BMA has platelets. Uh, concentrated bone marrow is basically PRP plus stem cells. It's got these mesenchymal stem cells. It's got the HSCs or hematopoietic stem cells and the ciliary progenitors. Uh, but it has all of the same factors and, and cells that are in peripheral blood as well. Um, it does have more IRAP protein 
than uh, peripheral blood and PRP, but it has equivalent A2M. It also both has fibrin, which comes in handy when we're trying to coat surfaces or we want our PRP or our bone marrow concentrate to clot in situ to kind of make a, an in vivo scaffold for that regenerative medicine. This table summarizes some of the differences between PRP, bone marrow concentrate, and allograft products. Um, in terms of viable research, uh, I would classify that as number of peer-reviewed publications and high-impact journals. PRP has been around longer, so it has more uh, yeah, supported clinical data around it. Bone marrow concentrate's not far behind, it's just not as many people are doing it. Allograft really doesn't have a lot of research support other than anecdotal evidence at best. In terms of cost, PRP kits are very affordable to the clinician and then that, that savings is passed on to the patients usually. Bone marrow concentrate kits tend to be a little bit more expensive than PRP. Allograft products also can be quite expensive. In terms of safety, PRP is no more of a risk to the patient than any blood draw that would be performed and any steroid injection that could be given. Uh, bone marrow concentrate is only slightly less rated on the safety scale, only because there are uh, very minor risks associated with the bone marrow aspiration, but with training, that could be virtually zero risk as well. Allograft, the clinician is at the mercy of the tissue bank or the source of that allograft tissue. We're relying on them uh, correctly sourcing and safely sourcing the, the material, how they process it, how they store it, how they deliver it to the clinician for their use. Compliance, we're talking about regulatory compliance with the US FDA. PRP is derived from whole blood. It, it, almost any tissue in the body you would inject with PRP would be considered homologous use because it's blood. Bone marrow concentrate is slightly more limited from a regulatory perspective uh, to uh, areas that deal with bone, joints, muscle, tendon, ligament, and spine. Um, some of the more exotic uses for PRP may not be appropriate in the FDA's eyes for bone marrow concentrate. Allograft has very limited regulatory compliance. Uh, we'll talk a little bit in a minute about uh, some of the, the specific rules, but uh, most generally speaking, if a donor product has living viable cells in it, it's not compliant unless it has FDA approval as a drug. Uh, that's the biggest thing. How a clinician uses it, uh, in the FDA's mind, it has to be homologously used. So you have to take tissue uh, that is serving a similar function in the harvested donor tissue as it is in the area that you're treating. In terms of healing properties, PRP has growth factors, but you're limited to the growth factors that were there in those platelets that you injected. Bone marrow concentrate is the most powerful healing capacity because it has all the benefits of PRP plus a concentration of mesenchymal and hematopoietic stem cells that are there as little generals on the ground to respond to the injury and, and heal that tissue. Allograft has three stars in this graph, but it is wildly dependent on the source tissue and how it's processed. Some allograft is very rich in growth factors. Some is almost worthless. Some of the limitations of PRP therapy, one, not all PRPs are created equal. This is also true for bone marrow concentrate. Different systems, different procedures can produce wildly different uh, mixtures of platelets and cells. And so it's a biologic. Biology is dictated by what it is that we have and what concentrations we have them. So it's not always an apples to apples comparison to look at two studies that do PRP because the concentrations of platelets Growth factors, white blood cells, red blood cells can be greatly variable from one group to another. Um, the clinical trials that evaluate the efficacy, uh, they don't always use these standardized protocols. Often they don't even publish the details about the protocol. They just say, we use PRP. Frankly, that's unacceptable. If there's one message I'd like to push onto the field is uh, try to be more consistent and what you do and report what you do so that as a field scientifically we can compare and try to make um, at least an apples to oranges comparison by knowing exactly what the patients were administered within a clinical study. The regulations, uh, this is a little, it can be thick reading for people that want to go do it, but I highly encourage if, if for people, if they don't do it themselves, uh, have your lawyer or some other colleague do it, uh, you, you're more than welcome to 
uh, contact the FDA. They have uh, these groups called tissue reference groups within the Center of Biologic uh, Evaluation and Research that uh, permit uh, questions. And they're usually pretty quick to respond if you have any specific questions and they'll make that response public. So it helps our field understand better what's gonna keep us safe and out of FDA jail as well as out of any kind of lawsuit by, by stepping too far outside the bounds of what FDA permits within regenerative medicine and, and specifically for PRP. What is nice is that um, 20, 21 CFR 1271 actually exempts blood and blood components and byproducts as long as they're autologous and minimally manipulated. So PRP is about as safe as you can be from a regulatory perspective. PRP systems, um, are usually based on gravity or centrifuge, taking advantage of the differences in the density or weights of different cellular components of the PRP. Red blood cells are the heaviest of all the components in blood and bone marrow aspirate, so they sink to the bottom of the tube. Um, white blood cells are the next heaviest, so the multinucleated, the more inflammatory white blood cells, they're going to sit at the bottom of the Buffy coat. Mononuclear white blood cells, and that includes some of those T cells that we're, we're excited about. They're going to be at the top of the buffy coat. Uh, platelets are the least dense or lightest uh, cellular component of blood. So they're going to be either at the top of the buffy coat or floating somewhere above the buffy coat. And the platelet poor plasma is that yellow fluid on top, which is very rich. It's a broth of proteins and cytokines and growth factors that also is very useful from uh, a regenerative capacity as well as a buffering agent in inflammatory and degenerative tissues. RBC advantages versus disadvantages. It's a source of oxygen. It's a source of nitric oxide. It's a source of iron. Has there been much re literature research saying that they're, they have a huge impact on uh, a successful regenerative therapy? The answer is no. But likewise, we don't really have any data that says that they're negative. Uh, PRP white blood cells versus higher white blood cells, sorry, low, low versus high white blood cells. Um, we'd already explained this earlier. It depends how you centrifuge. If you have a leukocyte-rich PRP, you're going to have higher platelet count. If you're trying to eliminate or reduce or minimize the white blood cell content, you're going to have lower platelet count. Um, there's situations where we actually may encourage inflammation to try to get the healing response that we didn't get, the patient didn't get at the time of the original injury. Um, these are things like tendon and muscle injuries. Are all white blood cells inflammatory? Well, I kind of stole my own thunder already in this presentation. The answer is no. A lot of the T cells may be, they're certainly regulatory and they may have anti-inflammatory capacities to them. It's really the, the macrophages and the granulocytes that we're, that we're most concerned about being inflammatory. Uh, this study, was a survey comparing different systems or methods to to prepare PRP. And as you can see, there, there's lots of ways to skin the cat. You can centrifuge at a higher RPM or G-force uh, for a shorter period of time or a longer period of time. And, and how you centrifuge your blood is going to have an impact on how those platelets consolidate with the white blood cells and the, and the, the, the final recipe or, or, or concoction of the PRP that, you're, that you result with. Uh, this study looked at the effect of different platelet uh, concentrations and PRP formulations due to different systems and its effect in vitro on, on human synoviocytes. Uh, what they found was that the uh, all the PRP, as well as the PPP, had a stimulatory effect um, on those synoviocytes. Um, the, in an in vitro setting, the RBCs may have slowed down the growth um, and, and, and metabolism of the synovia site. So the authors conclude, we don't know what the in vivo reality of this data is, but perhaps we will stay away from red blood cells. Analysis of PRP extraction 
and variations in the, in the PRP uh, components with four different kits. This is the same story. Uh, the, 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 the systems that you use, the conditions that the blood is centrifuged, and uh, also the final volume of PRP that is prepared are all going to have tremendous impact on the platelet recovery percentage, the concentration, the total number of platelets that you're able to deliver back to the patient. Growth factor and cytokine concentrations influenced by the composition of PRP. Uh, again, this is this is more reiteration of the fact that these different commercial systems can can recover significantly different amounts of platelets and growth factors in the PRP. Some of the catabolic cytokines may also be impacted, but that's usually a byproduct of how many white blood cells are in the PRP. This slide is called Comparative Release of Growth Factors for PRP, PRF, which is platelet-rich fibrin, and advanced PRF. Um, blood samples were taken from different donors and processed with these different systems. And, you know, once again, the, the system is very different. It, creates different amounts of PR platelets in the PRP, and then the total cytokines that come out of that PRP is greatly impacted as well. So if you're catching on to the theme of this presentation, it's pay very close attention to the system or the process you use when you're choosing on how to make PRP, because not all PRP systems are created equal. So some of the common variables here that we're talking about are platelet numbers or concentrations, is it leukocyte rich? Is it leukocyte poor? Do we have red blood cells or not? And is that important? Uh, are we doing anything to concentrate the A2M? Any of the other proteins, uh, whether it's fibrin or something else? And uh, is there any way we can adapt our centrifuge or spin protocol to tinker with that to get something better? Single spin versus double spin. Uh, certainly, there are there are players in this market space that emphasize that if you're not doing two spins, you're not doing it right. Two spin is one way to go about getting leukocyte poor PRP. It is not the only way to do that. Um, you just have to be cognizant of how am I centrifuging it, what fraction am I taking out of different steps, and what's in there. Is it better to have a golden colored sample or not? We discussed well. Typically, the more leukocyte rich a PRP is, uh, that means you're gonna have more white blood cells. As a result, you tend to have more red blood cells in the PRP. That's gonna give it an orange or even a red color. The, the PRP that is leukocyte poor is um, more of an amber golden color. So that indicates that it's leukocyte poor. This slide is called proprietary kit performance. This is completely hypothetical, but it's just to illustrate that um, you know, Mark Twain said there's lies and lies in statistics. Sometimes people will try to advertise their system as having a much higher enrichment factor or concentration X factor than a competitor. This just goes to show that when you take the first couple cc's of the most rich PRP, you're going to have the highest enrichment factor, the yellow line on this graph, and the highest number of platelets per milliliter. And as you take more volume of PRP, you're diluting the PRP, and so the, the platelet count and the enrichment factor goes down. But as you take more volume, you're also catching more platelets. So the total number of platelets, the red line that you give back to the patient actually increases as you extend the PRP volume. So if you're dealing with a joint that could accept more volume, why not take more volume? Because you're actually giving that patient more platelets and more of the goodies that are coming along in the platelet pore plasma that you use to extend that volume. If you're only interested in getting the highest concentration, that's really only applicable in small joints or discs where real estate is at a is at a premium and you could only do a small volume. Characterization and comparison of five PRP preparations in a single donor model. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. It is the same story all over again. And here's that graph that we already showed in a little bit more detail. The concern with small volume test tubes is that they, they've really flooded the market and they're, they're nothing more than hematology tubes. There are five or 10 cc's at a time uh, of blood that you centrifuge down to three to five cc's of quote unquote PRP. But basic math tells us that you can't expect better than a two X enrichment of your platelets when you do these kind of tubes. It's not getting that five to 10 X enrichment that we would classify as good PRP. So 
just because you centrifuge it doesn't necessarily make it worthwhile or worth the cost of doing it. I'm not even certain that these kinds of systems are any better clinically than just injecting whole blood. Optimal PRP is simple math. We know on average what the platelet count is in peripheral blood. We have a target of maybe 10x, possibly as low as 5x, possibly as high as 15 or 20x. And so it's just a matter of what volume are we going to start with, what volume do we want to end up with for the clinical application, and then what recovery percentage do we need from the device or the process we use to, to create that PRP. In this final section, we're going to talk a little bit about how to select the right PRP system for your practice. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to bring back Dr. Ching Chen uh, to discuss his per, uh, opinions and perspectives as a physician in this field. George. Thank you so much, Matt. It's always so enlightening to hear you speak. Uh, as a physician uh, who has had an incredible interest in this uh, realm, I've actually had the privilege of evaluating, I would I would honestly say, most of the large commercial systems on the market. And truthfully, uh, I, I recommend anybody who's interested in looking at uh, bringing in a regenerative medicine system into their clinic, uh, to to take advantage of that because these companies are eager for your business and they will bring their systems for you to evaluate. That being said, we're going to discuss some of the things that I think that are important for you to look at regarding what makes a good PRP system. One of the first things you should be considering is whether or not your system is an open versus a closed system. Now, when we talk about open versus closed, we're really... Um, is you can just imagine it like being a closed loop versus uh, a broken loop. Um, and is there a chain of command where something you can absolutely say um, is uh, left within that sterile environment, um, at least internally? Um, now, the truth of the matter is, though, is that all of the systems are uh, or should be um, internally sterile. Um, the open systems, what you do have is that you have a little bit more processing of it manually as opposed to relying on some type of predetermined uh, mechanism, uh, machinery, or other. You'll see in this image here uh, that we have a few examples of open systems in the top row, as well as a few examples of some closed systems in the bottom row. Now, what are the advantages of these closed systems? Well, the truth is that it uh, minimizes the human factor involved, meaning if you trust that the system, uh, the widget for the system is performing as it's intended, then it doesn't take a whole lot of training. You could have uh, someone with uh, maybe a medical assistant's background attain the blood and uh, quite easily and simply put it into the system and have it automated and process it for you. The issue with some of those is that, um, or excuse me, the, the pro of that uh, is not only the, the ease of use um, and sort of predetermined uh, uh, process, but it also minimizes the manipulation and minimizes the risk for contamination and thus infection. One of the concerns I have with these types of systems is that they're based off of flow cytometry uh, for the most part. Um, and if you've ever had someone bring in one of these systems into your office, you'll know that they're not, uh, they generally do not perform quite as well as you'd like them to do. Uh, there's these pre-programmed PRP volumes. They're certainly easy and convenient and the entire process might be able to be completely automated and pump out a syringe full of quote unquote uh, platelet enriched plasma um, within less than 20 minutes. Uh, the downside, another downside for these types of systems is that these contraptions are typically quite expensive. I have spoken with a number of these manufacturers and these centrifuge systems will run on the range of uh, twelve to twenty thousand um, dollars. They're also unable to concentrate things that you might be interested, um, as far as I'm aware of, uh, including alpha-2 macroglobulin, which um, is a potent quencher of the catabolic proteases and uh, a catabolic uh, sort of um, inflammatory markers uh, or, pro or promoters um, within the system. 
Uh, one thing I'll point out is that th these are typically digital and I supposedly you can uh, program into them uh, the amount of platelet-rich plasma you want, the leukocytes, and even the red blood cells that you'll have. I have had, uh, in my own experience, um, a few of these companies come into my practice, and one of the first things I tell them to do is, if you really are saying you can develop it or you can program it to pump out zero red blood cells, please show me so. You notice in these images here that I believe are stock photos for this uh, company in this image that um, that that PRP, if, just looking at actually images A and C, um, and I recognize that these are low resolution images, but it seems as though that the uh, platelet rich plasma that's being utilized in image D to inject uh, looks not too, too terribly dissimilar from the 60 cc uh, amount of blood that's being placed into the system. So I would caution you to uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, Matt did mention, you know, whether or not the eyeball test is absolutely the uh, last line, and certainly isn't because we need to get more definitive with our analyses of what we're um, injecting. That being said, uh, if you can't pass the eyeball test, you most certainly won't pass any more um, definitive analysis. Question is, is what is the optimal platelet concentration and volume for clinical applications? Now, Matt already briefed upon this, and we're sort of beating a dead horse at this point. But as clinicians, you know, every indication is going to have a potentially different application. Uh, if you're injecting a first carpal metacarpal joint, that is a joint in the hand that is not going to be able to accept a whole lot of volume. Uh, I might actually activate some of the PRP that I place in that joint, but at most it might be able to hold maybe one to two millimeters of uh, blood, or excuse me, one to two millimeters of product, or as opposed to a shoulder, a hip, or a knee, something like that, you might be able to place uh, somewhere along the lines of four to eight milliliters of um, product. Um, and just like had Matt, uh, Mer, uh, Matt had mentioned earlier, um, there certainly is evidence that says that um, you know more is not always going to be better. Um, that's the American way of things. You know, bigger, 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 larger, 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 more, more, more. Um, but the, we've certainly had to have some evidence out there that suggests that uh, more is not always better. And there's actually even some studies that show that um, platelet count itself, um, although it's ad hoc for the growth factors in there, it might not always directly correlate as well as we expect it to. What's also important to remember is that the actual dose of um, is de really dependent on how many platelets you had at the baseline and the ability to uh, concentrate it, but really the ability to sift it out and separate it from other things. And what I mean by that is that it's very easy for you to uh, create a system where instead of taking maybe five cc's, excuse me, five milliliters or eight milliliters of product at the end, you only take that last uh, bloody um, uh, sample of the Buffy coat at the very end and only have one milliliter of it and have it highly concentrated where it might say, uh, 10x over baseline or even 12, 15x over baseline. So these are all things that we need to keep into, uh, into mind as clinicians when we're developing individualized protocols for our patients. Again, uh, this has already been mentioned, but the volume of the PRP that you need to use for different indications is going to vary. Um, certainly, if you have more volume, you're going to have more total platelets because some of the PPP obviously is not completely depleted of platelets. Um, and what's also important to keep in mind is that there are other bioactive proteins that have not been completely identified or um, described in our type of literature, specifically for regenerative medicine. Um, but we certainly are realizing that our, um, the, the, these factors are involved in that healing cascade. They certainly are not inactive when you think of your PRP, P, PP, you should not just obtain it and think of it as uh, as byproduct or even waste. Uh, certainly, there are things in there that are very um, very potent and necessary for the healing cascade. Um, one thing included being uh, IRAP and uh, A2M, and these are things that we can uh, uh, chemoconcentrate down and obtain from that platelet-poor plasma. 
uh, to uh, utilize them for their bioactive properties. Again, looking at this last line on the bottom, it says having three millimeters, a milliliters of 10x PRP is really no better than six milliliters of 6x PRP um, because the six milliliters actually has more total platelets and growth factors, although the concentration factor may not um, quote unquote sound as impressive as the 10x. So here um, is a summary slide that talks about the important factors to consider when selecting the right PRP system. Um, and one idea is just, you know, is it flexible uh, or is it predetermined? And that goes back to, um, you know, obviously the clinician wants to be able to uh, tailor the treatment for the indication. Um, and is there flexibility in that PRP system or bone marrow system, if you will, or even adipose system to do that? Uh, are you able to obtain enough blood such that you can actually obtain enough platelets um, or even IRAP or A2M uh, to have a sufficient effective dose? Is the system easy, easy to use? Is it fast? Is it consistent to utilize? Um, and will it give you consistent and reliable results? And I think that's a big concern for people. And I think part of that is the PRP systems. And part of that, I think, people have to recognize is actually more patient dependent. It's a little bit outside of the scope of uh, this talk. Um, and the most important factor I honestly think for a lot of things is uh, is where it comes down for the patients. It's not just that they, they wanna get better, they're also very price conscious. And you want a high quality system that provides good value um, compared to the competitors on the market. Um, and so that is a big deal. I think it's important, certainly, um, to use products that are um, approved for uh, medical use in this country or in the country that you're utilizing them for. And so that is uh, an absolute must. You must be regulatorily compliant. So uh, that being said, um, yes, I have evaluated at least over at least 10 systems out there on the market. Um, there are a few of them that I think are at the higher end of them. I currently use the Excel PRP system. I like it for many of these reasons. I think it's very easy to use. I get reproducible results. Um, I can actually tailor it for the different things that I do, uh, not just treating orthopedic conditions um, and not just you know being able to limit my leukocytes um, or include my leukocytes, depending on whether or not I'm treating a tendon, a ligament, or a joint, but also how do I utilize it when I'm uh, performing medical aesthetics procedures, and uh, if I actually want to use a soft spin and uh, have sort of a more um, enriched uh, uh, PPP, if you will, um, and utilizing that high volume because I don't want the red blood cells in there. I think that the Excel PRP system it certainly uh, qualifies or satisfies all these requirements. Um, it is compliant. Um, and as far as compared to many of the systems that I've seen and tested on the market, I think it is a fantastic use. Um, and it has been designed by some very, very intelligent people um, that are, some of them are my friends. I don't know if Matt, you have anything else that you'd like to add to this uh, discussion or any thoughts on this uh, peer or what do you think makes a PRP system good? I certainly know that you've designed many, many, many scientific products um, and especially in regards to regenerative medicine. Well, it's hard to pick one thing, George. Um, I think first and foremost, the clinician has to pick something they know is safe. And so on that discussion about closed versus open, um, and then there's a middle ground that most of these systems actually fall in, which is functionally closed. Technically, there is an opening where you load and unload blood and PRP, but for all intents and purposes, it's, it's a closed system where it's not open air, uh, like a, an old school test tube that's just got the, the top of it off. Um, from an efficacy side, we want to be able to control what it is that we're preparing. Do we have the ability to get the platelet con count in the range that is desired for whatever application is clinically. Do we have the ability to adjust the white blood cell content, yes or no? 
Do we have the ability to adjust the volume of the PRP? Because if we're doing a large joint, of course we want to use more volume. There's no reason not to draw in the extra benefits of more platelets and more of the of the regenerative proteins that are in platelet poor plasma. If we're doing a small volume application like a finger joint injection or a facet injection or a cervical disc, there's no use in preparing 10 cc's if we're not going to use more than two. So having that flexibility is very important as well. Um, some positives about the Excel system is it gives the user the ability to choose how much of the platelet poor plasma is collected with the Buffy coat. It also gives the user the ability to collect just the top fraction of the Buffy coat, which is platelets plus the non-inflammatory white blood cells versus actually collecting the entire Buffy coat and even getting a little bit of the red to make a leukocyte rich PRP. Its recovery percentage of both platelets and white blood cells is in line with some of the best in class uh, for PRP in the US market. That's fantastic. That that if Matt Murphy gives it endorsement, I I certainly can appreciate that, and it helps ju me justify um, what I'm trying to do and accomplish in my practice. Well, I'd like to thank again uh, Apex Biologics um, for their support, uh, and again Boston BioLife for inviting us uh, to give this uh, webinar today. I certainly always learn a lot every time I listen to Matt talk. Um, and fortunately for me, I, I have the privilege of doing that quite a few times a year. Uh, thanks, George. You're very kind. Um, I, I think that um, uh, PRP and regenerative medicine in general is a big subject, it's very complex. It's hard to cover all in one in one presentation. But um, you know, for the for the audience out there, being able to understand what it is that we're trying to achieve, what's the final formulation, how do I get there, and always keep an tally of uh, for each patient, how to customize this therapy and, and be cognizant of the products and processes that you use to accomplish that. Excellent. Well, thanks for making my job easy because normally that's the kind of the closing remarks that I would make, but I think you guys did a great job at combining both the biotechnology side as well as the clinical side, citing the research, but really bringing the most recent information to light because we, as we know in this field, uh, things change every day and there's just looking at the industry participation, we see all the different kits and techniques, but we also see an uh, overarching application for these products and they're being accepted more and more by the clinical community, but also being demanded by the public. So having access to scientific publications, research and thought leaders like yourself, uh, George and Matt, I think is really beneficial to the industry. And it's what Boston BioLife is all about. So we want to thank you for taking the time to uh, do this webinar. And we'll look forward to seeing uh, George and uh, Matt on the road uh, in the future at upcoming meetings put on by Army, uh, being co-sponsored and supported by Boston BioLife. And also we'll continue to have them on uh, as expert uh, contributors to our ongoing regenerative medicine education series. Thank you so much, Joe. Yep. Thanks, Joe and George. For additional information on this topic or to ask the presenter a question, please email us at info at bostonbiolife.com. Boston BioLife is pleased to announce a brand new resource for our technology providers and our healthcare providers and anyone really who's interested in real-time subscription publications. So this is our online peer-reviewed references that include 17 million publications from 9,000 medical journals. These are peer-reviewed uh, medical journals and they are published in real time. And it's a great way to learn at your own pace. And as it says, in your own space, these include Dynamed Plus, which is clinical research, as well as biotechnology source, which is access to research publications in the world of life sciences and biochemistry. This is an easy way to earn up to 20 CME credits as well as stay current on the research landscape. For a limited time, Boston BioLife is pleased to offer a special promotion. Earn up to 20 CMEs and access unlimited search publications from now till the end of June for $249. This is an excellent opportunity for you or your colleagues to earn extra CME credits as well as stay tuned to the research landscape, which is ever changing. And this is great for nurses, physicians, and PAs and or other healthcare providers interested in 
in publications and research in new and emerging therapies. For more information on this, please go to medpubresearch.com or email us at info at bostonbiolife.com. Or as always, feel free to call at 978-569-8080. Boston Biolife is also pleased to offer professional memberships to our healthcare providers. These give you access to some of the tools that we've been discussing on this webinar, including access to the CME peer-reviewed research tools, um, discounts on other collaborative events that we're co-sponsoring, access to your name in the member directory and complimentary webinars, as well as industry updates, discounts on vendor products, and access to a buyer's guide, as well as videos that come from the Boston BioLife Academy. So look at the different memberships we have, silver, gold, and platinum to see which one works best for you. For more information on our healthcare professional memberships, please visit www.bostonbiolife.com. Boston BioLife Academy is your 24-7 online healthcare training resource. We have close to 100 individual topics in the areas of biochemistry and clinical practice. This is excellent information for healthcare providers in regenerative medicine, functional medicine, and health and wellness. Please visit bostonbiolifeacademy.com for more information. Please visit bostonbiolife.com for a list of other partner events coming up in 2020. These are industry education programs from societies as well as technology providers. They include both didactic and hands-on learning. For a complete list, please visit bostonbiolife.com. Please visit the site often as we are constantly adding new content and new information on other educational programs. We hope to see you at one of these live events. For access to this webinar and other exciting topics, please visit bostonbiolife.com backslash webinars. We're constantly adding new content to our webinar series, which includes topics from clinical science, technology, and medical practice. Thank you for attending another Boston BioLife webinar. My name is Joseph Krieger, president of Boston BioLife, and on behalf of myself, Sarah Carroll, our executive director, and Michael Cameron, our creative director. We look forward to seeing you at another live event. Please feel free to call us at 978-569-8080 or visit bostonbiolife.com for more information on our services and events that we'll be participating in. Thank you very much.